Afternoon all. I thought we'd honour James Plaskett on this channel with a look at one of his favourite, most memorable games. Actually, I have in front of me also the magazine Kingpin, done by Jonathan Manley, an excellent magazine which Plaskett is a regular contributor to. And in a future video, I'll try and check out Kingpin in more detail. But um, in issue number 20, there's a James Plaskett interview. And he's asked, what is your most memorable game? And it's this game we're going to look at, which Plaskett describes as a unique experience. Um, basically, his win against Miles from the Lugano Open 1986 was a unique experience, in Plaskett's words. I have not seen any other chess game that reminded me of it. And also, during play itself, the sensation was very strange. It felt as if the chess men were moving themselves and the two players bore no responsibility for the astonishing creation that resulted. Then had they been demonstration board operators who merely displayed the decisions of third parties. So, Haskett had a surreal experience here with this game. Let's have a look. And it's in detail, I'll give you the annotation link in detail on kingpinchess.net in the description of the video. But uh, let's go through it. So c4 was played by Plaskett, and often he plays e4, but in this game, okay, maybe he doesn't want a sharp e4 game. And um, the reply of Anthony Moles was e5, so it's a kind of reversed Sicilian here. We're going to use the two-pass method. There's going to be extensive detailed variations in the second pass, but let's just try and appreciate it from a kind of intuitive point of view that um, he's comfortable playing a Sicilian basically in reverse here uh, e3 and then we see d6 so black is voluntarily closing up this bishop so is it going to fianchetto though knight c3 yes g6 perhaps more aggressively placed on g7 than e7 and we see g3 now and you might think this is slightly strange, weakening these light squares a bit, but it's justified if white's going to play for d4 later. This e3 is very useful, and it's also marking out f4. So if black's got a plan of f5 later, that f4 square is locked down at the moment. Bishop g7, bishop g2. Comfortable looking position, avoiding theory. Very simple to play this opening without learning tons of theory. Knight e7. Okay, and we see d4 now. Black castled, knight ge2. So white's play looks very sensible and positional. The control on the d5 looks very nice. Knight d7. Now, the castle is a very aggressive move by Anthony Miles. f5. Even though f4 looks as though it's locked down, we have this bishop here with latent energy against f4, these two pawns against f4. So what is black's goal in playing f5 here? Can it be punished in some way? Well actually the central tension is adjusted here with d takes e5. So what does this do? Black doesn't really want a little centre with just a pawn on d6 by taking with a piece. But um, he takes with the pawn and this suffers a little bit from a side effect. This diagonal might now be more sensitive than usual. And it's this diagonal which is honed in on with this next move, b3. There's no tactical problems here. The knights are reinforcing each other. This bishop can be used on a3. And that could be quite an unpleasant experience for black sometimes. Anthony Miles plays c6, so he's voluntarily weakening uh, d6, but he's keeping control of d5 now. So is there going to be an unpleasant visitor on the d6 square soon? First of all, we see bishop a3, though. Black does seem to be squirming slightly already from this position. Could we regard white's opening as quite successful already? The bishops seem to be naturally placed and a crossfire on two different color complexes. 
The rooks just maybe need the d4. Maybe if the queen moves, you can imagine a rook on d1 intensifying the pressure. Or is the queen got a more ambitious idea of invading the position on d6? It would be an unwelcome visitor, perhaps, on d6. Okay, let's see. Queen e8. Well, actually, there is a tactical idea now that black has a latent tactical idea of actually playing f4. It's not totally ruled out because of this pressure on c3. This is a bit of a loose piece, even though it's only protected, it is protected rather by the knight. f4 could be a tactical problem. You can imagine if, if it's distracted, then bishop c3, if you take, take, and then there's a problem of f3. So this next move uh, looks like a necessary concession which uh, James plays. He plays f4. Positionally locking in this bishop in its own pawn chain, but also maybe on the plus side for black, if now e4 as played, uh, this this bishop is has got that nice diagonal, and this pawn might be useful potentially for d3. So who's better here? But what other choices were there? Otherwise, potentially white is getting a very very juicy. Um, position well e takes might consider e takes here not knight takes losing the knight but e takes but we'll, we'll check that out in the second pass e4 looks committal but sort of justified but now we get this invasive queen move queen d6 immediately tactically threatening of course to win a piece not too many options for black here really <laughs> with this knight so it's protected okay and with that, there's a possibility of bishop f8 on the cards for black. And you might think there's a loose piece here as well to potentially expo exploit on a kind of skewer type tactic, so the weaker piece is behind the skewer. So attacking the queen could be a useful resource for black, you'd think. Rook ad1 is played now. And now knight f8. So is Anthony Miles trying to just play for something like bishop e6 or knight e6 and then maybe later well with knight e6 there might be bishop f8 so the use of the e6 square looks imminent anyway and the more logical piece to use would would seem to be knight e6 to make way for bishop f8 and indeed we see in this position uh, move rook d2 not not too worried by anything tactically at the moment so White's just calmly maybe putting putting more pressure on that D file to mark it out. Knight E6, and now it really does seem to be a, a stronger possibility of Bishop F8 being a nuisance at some point. Imagine this this attack on the Queen having to move. There's a loose Bishop on A3. Okay, so quite so far, and um, if we compare this game to a potential exhibition, which um, could have been successful in 1999. Jim Plaskett was after a giant octopus. Uh, will we have a giant octopus in this game? Well, we might do in terms of the amazingness of what we're going to see soon. So believe it or not, uh, there's a chess equivalent of a giant octopus coming up soon in this game. We see the move bishop h3 here, which looks a little bit odd. Mind you, the bishop wasn't doing much staring at e4 here. So you might think, well, at least on h3, it might be supporting something like g4, which might be useful to give g3 the knight, for example, with knight g3, and undermine this pawn chain generally. But at the moment, with this bishop tying down this knight to protecting c3, this looks a little bit way off, this idea of playing for g4. And what if black decided to clamp down with h5? Well, actually... Black is more keen to do something else with the pawn structure here. Forget about clamping down on g4. Black plays a very aggressive move indeed. g5. Threatening to put the bishop back in prison with g4, stirring against that pawn again. But if now white takes, surely then, actually, there's a problem here that this knight's going to be quite aggressive taking on g5. For example, isn't that going to be a really big problem. Well, actually, f takes g5 is played, not fearing that in particular. 
And in this position, Anthony Miles, he doesn't play knight takes g5 immediately. Instead, he chooses knight g6, which, if you remember about this diagonal and this loose bishop here, if this, this queen is moving in particular to bishop f8, this bishop's now potentially in trouble to bishop f8, you'd think. So maybe any normal player would seriously be considering uh, perhaps doing something about bishop f8 here. Plaskett is by no means a normal player. He's a very good imaginative grandmaster who once won the British Championship with very imaginative attacking games. And it's his imagination here which let him conceive the following idea, which maybe it's not approved by computers running at depth 22, 23, etc. But uh, it's a really brilliant idea conceptually now to seemingly allow this dangerous bishop f8 tactic. Can you guess what is played in this position if I give you 10 seconds starting from now? You may want to pause the video and come back and think as well. Okay. Plaskett plays bishop takes f5. And we're starting to see the giant octopus of this game emerge. Okay. Black plays the seemingly lethal bishop f8. Has white tactically blundered? Has it been a bit sleepy to allow this? Whoops. Oh dear. Where can the queen go? There's got no squares actually. The queen. This knight's covering and the rook's covering c7. e5 is covered. f4 is covered. There's no escape back. All the squares are covered. Queen d8, that's covered by the knight. There's no escape here. But the idea is unveiled now. What does white play here? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, knight takes e4, queen sack. We all love a good queen sacrifice. Here, what is going on though? No. Well, it seems as though at least there's going to be a few forcing moves to play with when the queen's taken. So bishop takes d6, knight takes d6. Black has to do something about his queen now. And it's a nice fork from that knight. So f7 looks to be in trouble. If you look at white's pieces, they've all exploded into life, actually. This bishop's no longer a prisoner. It's having a good time. It's no longer staring at a pawn on e4. This knight's ready to pounce and maybe use f4. The rooks can maybe uh, use either d file or this f file. So what's going on? We see the move queen d8, which tactically looks quite sensible from a number of uh, perspectives. Pinning the knight, apparently, to the rook on d2. Unless white wants to try knight e4, of course, protecting the rook. Uh, but um, there's another move here, which is useful. Knight takes f7 should be considered as well, because on queen takes d2, there might be something like knight h6 check. We'll check these out in the second pass. It's a very interesting position now, tactically. But the move played basically makes the threat of knight takes f7 more effective. The move played is simply in this position, the very calm rook d3. Just keeping the rook protected, keeping this rook on f1. So the bishop's now protecting the rook. So there's a threat renewed of knight takes f7, among other things. And rook d7 doesn't help because bishop takes e6 check. That would be interrupting the protection of the knight. So this knight on d6 is a nuisance. White has that octopus knight, as I called it, from the famous Karpov-Kasparov encounter. Except it's white with the octopus knight on d6. We found the giant octopus. Indeed. OK. What are its implications? Well, Anthony Miles is a very resourceful player. He's not going to take this line down. What he does here is an exchange sacrifice or what he hoped maybe was an exchange sacrifice. 
He played rook takes f5. Now clearly, knight takes f5 seems to fall to queen takes d3. So it seems as though rook takes f5 uh, is necessary. But then what would happen after rook takes f5? That's really, um, it wasn't a move played and it's a move which clearly we need to check in great detail. Intuitively, rook takes f5 might seem to have a tactical flaw with knight takes g5 hitting the rook and that might be quite unpleasant but there's other possibilities as well uh, to explore here. But let's leave that for the second pass. In the game actually, remarkably and paradoxically, um, even though it seemed that the idea of rook d3 was about you know increasing the security of the rook so it, it wouldn't be a tactical liability on this d file. Paradoxically now, James Plaskett offers the rook on a plate to be munched. He plays knight takes f5, offering queen takes d3 now. But what is going on tactically? Well, this octopus, its tentacles stretch to the other side of the board here. Intuitively, without checking with an engine, it seems actually there could be a problem in this position with knight h6 check. Because then, if the king goes on to this diagonal, then we have this killer bishop with bishop b2. How will black be protecting itself on this diagonal? A bit like Plaskett's puzzle with a killer bishop, which the knights cannot do anything about. So there's two of them here instead of four. So, okay. In this variation, it seems, wow, this concept that uh, now the rook seems to be immune. Uh-oh, black must be thinking, this is harder than I thought. So queen takes g5 is played instead. And now we see a forcing move again. The queen is keeping the knight clearly out of h6. We see h4. And if queen g4, then knight h6, thank you very much, winning the queen if nothing else. So the queen plays queen h5. And you might think, okay, what forcing moves are available to white? Is there any, any, any good ones to consider? Well, in this position, I wonder if you can spot what was played, which you might think is not possible. So if I give you 10 seconds here, what would you play as white? Okay, g4, plays it anyway, inviting the queen to take on g4 with check, which is not something maybe the less imaginative of us would, would consider too much, inviting the queen to take material with check. How outrageous, you might think. But knight eg3, and it all makes sense. Again, the threat is renewed of knight h6 check to win that queen on g4. The queen has to run away from this, and it can't use h5 anymore because of that knight. Okay, so it plays queen h3 to hide from that horrible check, but the check is now played anyway. King g7. A repetition. Okay, the signing more what to do. King f6, the king ventures out. Can it really survive? All of white's pieces look quite menacing in relation to the king, especially this potentially huge dark square bishop, which there's no counterpart in black's position. Can the knights really fend off all these dangerous checks? And these guys are still at base. They haven't left base yet. We see knight h5 check here, and the king ventures out very courageously to e5. Okay, and now we see knight f g3, the knights protect each other. And also is bishop b2 now a major threat because this knight retreat is now covering the e4 square. Is a mating net being woven around the king? And why is this starting to look like a fantasy chess composition all of a sudden, which couldn't be reached possibly in a normal game? Okay, well, Black plays now, knight e f8. Right, 
and now this this big bishop comes on b2, king e6, and now another forcing check, knight g7 check. And it's all over here. Surely, can black's king really survive this? King e7, and it looks as though there's dangerous bishop checks. And bishop a3 was actually played, and black resigned here. The black king seems to be in the mating net. And also, it seems bishop f6 might be tempting, but it might allow king f7. So bishop a3 might be the absolute best move here. Because surely the king's now in a mating net. This knight stopping it going back, the rook stopping f7. d7 stopped by this one. e6, these are covered by the knight. Oh dear. Black resigned here. If he plays c5, let's check. Bishop takes c5 is mate. Okay. And the adventure is over. The octopus knight on d6, which was created, did have a wonderful aesthetic effect in this game and wove a wonderful mating net around the black king. So maybe Plaskett did find his octopus after all in this game. Let's have a look in the second pass and check the many detail variations but there's a there's a very fantastic detailed annotation I'll give in the description of this video as well. Um, I think we can only try and see some of the variations that were implied in the second pass but we'll see. So White had a pleasant looking position okay from playing quietly here after castles f5 which the engine actually doesn't really like the look of f5 but uh, in a human point perspective it offers a lot of problems and opportunities a move such as f5 okay d takes e5 is liked by Houdini actually in this position maybe it's just trying to exploit this diagonal so d takes e5. If we do take with a piece and accept the little center, move like b3. This is a bit passive, this structure. If black ever plays c6, this is a continual target. So black's play, he gets rid of, uh, you know, that fixed target on, on d6. Okay, so he plays d takes e5. And we see now the move b3, which which looks logical, but this shutdown later of this bishop is a bit of a serious positional concern. Um, and the engine's actually implying e4, which you might think, well, isn't d4 weakened? Doesn't it give black a standard maneuver on d4? You know, something like this that d4 could could be a problem but on the other hand it looks a bit of a botvinic system but maybe it wouldn't uh, present too many practical difficulties for black if there is such a maneuver for d4 here so this is interesting in itself just to leave the pawn seemingly passive on e3 against black playing f4 and just use this diagonal instead it's an alternative plan okay which may be looked down a little bit at this depth but it's it looks fairly dangerous from a human perspective to play this clamp down on black playing f4, try and put pressure on that sensitive diagonal. Invite e4 in many cases. In fact the invitation for e4 here is suggested to actually play here but black plays c6 instead. And you see white technically the advantage is going up and the immediate queen invasion with d6 is liked here but bishop a3 is also a strong move and it's coming up either just to probe those dark squares basically Queen e8. Now let's move f4. Is it actually a little bit controversial? Was it actually needed? Was this such a big deal? Black playing f4. You know, maybe the bishop can just move to e4, for instance. Is it such a big deal to have to do something about it and potentially allow black this seemingly positional kind of bind to lock the the bishop in? Was it needed? The engine is kind of thinking at this depth maybe some other moves are possible like 
f3 looks very very passive to play f3 or e4 now e4 again it's just weakening this d4 square a move like knight f6 let's let's take this as an example it's another game why it's got a small advantage it's no big deal it's less than half a pawn okay so the tension uh, increases in, a, in in some ways with f4 keeping the structure quite interesting here trying to keep these knights out of the game inviting e4 and actually from energy point of view it actually loves this much more now after e4 so something is up with black's position here it's not all roses just because that bishop's being blocked in queen d6 forcing move rook f7 virtually forced rook ad1 looks normal strong putting more pressure knight f8 okay so we get this idea that yeah knight e6 and then black can look forward to even g5 as in the game rook d2 and we see knight e6 being prompted liked by the engine here and here is where things get quite interesting then you might even think well hang on what about even g4 straight off the bat to try and undermine this structure well again this this diagonal could be a real problem let's just try this g4 because bishop h3 looked a bit strange but fg what does white do now he can't move this knight because of this knight takes e4 now knight f5 the queen's horrible target here rook d7 and things can backfire say the queen moves here knight takes e3 that would be very nasty whoa so the queen is a bit of a liability tactically as this as this shows you can't just play g4 to undermine the center so this bishop h3 is interesting very interesting the engines from the engine point of view Rook c2 looks pox, poxy, defending a knight, why, why move the rook there? So bishop h3 looks as though it's interesting, it's actually coming up here on the radar as a move, as an idea. Okay, and we see now g5 from black. Okay, very, very interesting position now. fg is not on the horizon here as a move. Cautious moves are recommended here by the engine. Queen b4, get the queen out of trouble. The engine screaming. Rook d d1. Give the queen d2 maybe. So you can, after knight g6, play queen d2. That's the idea we see here. Okay, caution is cried out for by the engine. Fg5 was flirted with just then. Let's go into it now. Fg5. So the Houdini approved move knight g6, which was played by Anthony Miles, is played here, knight g6. Bishop f8 also interesting. Let's go with knight g6. So we see bishop takes f5, seemingly running into this huge tactic, simple tactic, bishop f8. Okay. And this is very interesting at this depth. It's as though at depth 17, less than half a pawn advantage. What is going on here? A move like bishop g6 is interesting. Who would have thought that? Let's check this out. Bishop g6? First of all, rook takes f1, king takes hg, queen e5, offering the bishop. Bishop takes knight takes e4 dead equal we have a perpetual check scenario it seems look at this what's going on here bishop sacrifice looks as though there's chances for white in this position incredibly so queen f8 rook f2 still looks as though there might be some tactical chances but the idea wasn't to sacrifice the bishop, the idea was to sacrifice the queen. So the more outlandish knight takes e4, discovering the octopus knight on d6 now. 
And from an engine point of view, yes, disapproval, disapproval. What is going on here? Isn't black just better? Bishop takes d6, knight takes d6. The move queen d8 was played. Is that an inaccuracy? Queen e7 is mentioned here on this brief analysis. Queen e7, would that improve things? It does pin the knight against the bishop here. So knight takes f7, there's an option of queen takes a3. And now what? Knight d6, it still looks complicated and dangerous. Knight takes c8 is threatened with bishop e6 to follow. Surely, queen a5 hitting the rook. Rook dd1. Queen e5 protecting that knight against knight, something like knight c8. e4. It's still a mess, this position. I think it's easy for black to go wrong. If, for example, black played bishop d7, then knight takes b7, and this is still really, really dangerous for black. So, okay, that was interesting as well, queen e7. But in the game, queen d8 was played, relying instead on this kind of pin, but this kind of pin instead, a more valuable piece. The rook, in theory, rook d3 is played now. Is that one of the better moves? In fact, the engine likes rook d3 a lot here. Rook d3 in this position. Okay, so black lashes out with rook takes f5 here. And these other alternatives look to be not so hot now. Queen a5 and queen f8. If queen a5, well, what's the queen doing after b4? It's getting kicked. The bishop, the bishop is now protected. Knight takes f7. It starts to look a bit unpleasant here. King being dragged out like this. Rook d6 might be on the cards. That stopped. Knight c3 now has d5 to go to. Bishop b2 and white's all of a sudden emerging with a dangerous initiative in this example of formation. Rook f6 and if black's forced to give up the queen. Doesn't look so hot for black. We've gone far. Let's go back. So rook d3. We saw black lashing out with rook takes f5. Is black starting to be worse here? We have the dreaded 0, 0, 0 with knight takes f5, which was played. And I assume that this, this was losing, but apparently it's not. There's a resource here I missed in that first pass. Queen takes, check, here. The bishop's not so lethal because check, there's knight g7. This knight's covering f8. So this is just a perpetual. Unless there's anything better. Just a perpetual. Okay. So maybe black could have taken on d3 if he wanted that. But no. Okay, after the knight takes f5, he doesn't take on d3. He plays queen takes g5 in here. It looks as though now there's a clear advantage to white here, more than the pawn, with the forcing move h4 leading things. So h4, clearly the queen can't go to g4 because of knight h6 check. So we see queen h5, and this move g4 pops up immediately. Plus 2.74, huge advantage here with the move g4. This queen's in real trouble after g4. Getting that beautiful square g3 for the other knight. So it takes knight eg3, threatening knight h6 check. It looks pretty bad now for black. If he tries knight e5, or well, just gives up the queen. It can't be that good, surely. No good. It could be all over here in this position. So black tried queen h3, check. Knight hf5 is played. In fact, knight gf5 might be more accurate. 
apparently forcing queen takes f5. If king f6 here, bishop b2, knight e5. And in this position, a very, very interesting resource indeed. So just drag and drop the queen away from g4 here. If white could get in knight g4, or is it? Pardon me. Let's have a look. No, I'm not going to speculate. But e4 is on on the, on the board here. e4 offering the rook again on d3. What on earth is this about? Queen takes d3. Knight g4 check. There is a move. There's a couple. If king f7, knight takes e5, winning the queen. Ah, oh, that's why that rook is a, is immune here. So what would black be doing in this position? He's in big trouble. He'd have to give up his queen. And it's hopeless. This knight's pinned, of course, so no problem. Give up the queen, just take it. No problem. So th this is a crunch variation, which maybe Jim missed. Maybe it was a bit in time pressure. I think I, I noticed from the annotations at King Ping. Okay. Now Knight H5 check. Still White's got the advantage though. King E5. Knight F G3. Very good. Getting things organized for this kind of mating net for Bishop B2 to be very, very effective. Knight E F8. And it's a mate in four. Bishop b2 check, knight g7 check, bishop a3. We're going into this mate in four. And here, black resigned. Jim found his octopus in this game. I think we can regard this as one of his immortal games. But uh, he's played many other exciting games, which we, we I think we should also cover on this channel soon. And uh, thank, you, thank you to him for commenting on a video recently, his puzzle, Plaskett's Puzzle, what became known as Plaskett's Puzzle, a remarkable endgame study, which I urge you to check out as well as this video, which will be in the Brilliancy's Collection playlist, uh, which we'll see a link in this video. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.